Here's an interesting question. You have a donut and a box and are trying to give this donut to your friend Bob. After putting the donut in the box and locking it up, you realize that your friend will also need to know the code to the lock. The problem is that your roommate Emily is a bit hungry and wants to take this donut from you. Whenever you communicate in any way, shape, or form to Bob, Emily is also listening to or reading whatever you send to them. How can you and Bob agree on a code for the lock despite always being listened to? Maybe you could use some kind of cipher. That way the code will be encrypted in some way. We'll use one that moves all of the numbers between 0 and 9 to the right by 4, placing the overhanging piece at the front. So if the code is 4, 2, 8, 7, you can send the encrypted code 8, 6, 2, 1, and Emily will be none the wiser. But what happens if you just send the code 8621 to Bob? He doesn't know how you encrypted it, and he won't be able to figure out how it's encrypted any faster than Emily could. And if you also send the rules to your cipher along with the code so that Bob can get the original, then Emily also has access to the code 8621 and the rules for encryption. So now she can just reverse these rules and get the original code. And if you encrypt the rules, then you have to send the new rules to the new encryption and so on forever. So this method seems fruitless. The problem we've come across is that sending these rules to Bob so he can obtain the original code always seems to result in Emily also having the rules. It seems easy to send Bob the rules, but it's also easy for Emily to have them. Ideally, we'd want a situation where it's easy for you and Bob to agree on the rules, but Emily would be stuck trying to figure them out. If we think of sending information to Bob as a function, where you decide on the inputs, then it would be the case that Emily and Bob have access to the function and its outputs, but not its inputs. So all we have to do is come up with a function that you and Bob can use where generating the outputs is really easy, but finding out what inputs gave that output is really difficult. If such a function exists, maybe we could use it to send an encrypted key, then Emily would have a really hard time figuring out what the original key was. The function that ends up being quite useful is one we've all probably seen before, b to the x. Not the normal exponentiation that we're used to though. What we actually want is something called modular exponentiation. Here, this mod operation is just asking what the remainder is when we divide by n. So if b is equal to 3, n is equal to 79, and we plug 36 into this function, we get that 3 to the 36 is this very large number. Now we divide 79 into this as many times as we evenly can, and whatever is left over is our remainder. In this case, we get that 3 to the 36 mod 79 is 38. This way of doing things is pretty slow though, and as it turns out, we can do modular exponentiation much faster than this. It relies on a couple of tricks and properties of the exponent. Firstly, we look at the exponent and represent this as a sum of powers of 2, so 36 is equal to 2 squared plus 2 to the fifth. Then we replace the original exponent with this new expansion, and using properties of the exponent, we can represent this as 3 to the 2 to the 2 times 3 to the 2 to the 5. Notice, and this requires a little bit of insight, that in the general case of b to the 2 to the i, if we square this, then we get b to the 2 times 2 to the i, which is the same as b to the 2 to the i plus 1. Since we know that 3 to the 2 to the 0 is just 3, we can fill this table out very fast by repeated squaring of 3. 
We square 3 once to get 9, square 9 to get 81, and remember though, we're doing things mod 79, so we look at the remainder when we're dividing by 79, which is 2. We repeat this process, filling it in with 4, 16, and 19. Using this table, we can just take the parts pertaining to 3 to the 2 to the 2, and the part pertaining to 3 to the 2 to the 5, and replace our numbers with those. So we actually get that 3 to 36 mod 79 is the same as 2 times 19 mod 79, which is 38, exactly what we got before. This process is known as fast modular exponentiation, and it's kind of a lot when you see it for the first time in action. Feel free to pause and understand every step so you can calculate these exponents by yourself. In our original way of doing things, we would have had at least 35 steps of multiplying 3 by itself, but now we have just 5 steps of squaring. So how much time do we actually cut generally? If we were just to multiply 3 by itself n times, the algorithm would have a running time of O of n, meaning that the running time is bounded by the linear function n. But we can do our new algorithm with a running time of about O log n. This means that if we input an exponent of a very large bit length, we'd only need about this much time as compared to our first algorithm. And comparing the graphs of these two functions, we can see just how big of a difference this is going to make on large inputs. Specifically, this algorithm is exponentially faster than going the normal way. Here's some crude code I wrote in SageMath, a coding program for math-related stuff, that does this fast modular exponentiation algorithm. At the bottom, I set our base to 3, and we choose a random 100-digit exponent and a random 100-digit modulus. We're going to run this on my old laptop and see how fast it goes. So about 60 milliseconds, pretty fast. But you can probably spend more time into setting up a key, so what if the exponent was a thousand digits long? Well, it took me about 15 seconds, a very reasonable amount of time to spend, and a huge exponent. Remember though, we want a function that is easy to evaluate in one direction, but difficult to evaluate in the other direction. We can exponentiate really fast, which satisfies the first property, but how fast can we do the reverse of this? That is, if I give you the equation 3 to the x equals 57 mod 79, how fast can you give me x? Well, if we plot the entirety of the inverse function, we get something peculiar. An absolute mess. Just from looking at this graph, we might make the assumption that it's really difficult to tell what input gave an output. Of course, with the graph, we can just visually look at the points and tell that x equals 33. The crux of this problem is that if you want to be able to do this generally and very fast, you need to give me a function for a graph that looks like this, that works for any base and any modulus. So how do you connect these dots so that no matter what output I give you, you can give me x in a small enough time frame. The problem I have just laid out is called the discrete logarithm problem. Logarithm because we are trying to reverse this modular exponentiation, which is analogous to the regular logarithm reversing normal exponentiation. As it turns out, this problem is extremely hard. So hard that we have no current really fast way to do this. The fastest known algorithm to solve this generally is only sub-exponential, which you can think of as a bit better than the worst case scenario. This means that we presumably have the function we've been looking for. Since modular exponentiation is so fast, we can use a very large exponent and get an output in just a few seconds to minutes, such that Emily would take thousands if not millions or billions of years to find out what our exponent was but there is still a problem at hand. If you have a secret exponent and generate some number using this method, 
then send it to Bob so he can have access to the donut, then Emily can't find our exponent, but neither can Bob. So how can you and Bob agree on a key? The secret to this problem is to have both you and Bob have your own secret key that nobody knows but you or him. That way, you can send each other information in hopes of using your secret keys and the numbers you send to each other to mathematically arrive at the same key. Then you can set the code to the key you both arrived on while Emily is stuck trying and trying to figure out what your secrets are. Since she won't be able to do so in any reasonable amount of time due to the complexity of the discrete log, then the donut is safe until Bob can get his hands on it. But how do we do this exactly? So, we start off with you and Bob. You both agree on a modulus N and a base B. Since you can't do this without Emily also knowing, this is public information and she has access to both of these numbers. Now you can secretly decide on your own exponents, say X and Y, and it doesn't matter what these exponents are so long as you don't tell anyone. Each of you now compute b to the x and b to the y respectively. We'll call your computation capital A and Bob's computation capital B. Now each of you tell each other A and B, so you each now have that info and so does Emily. By doing this, you've shrouded what your secret was and the discrete log will keep Emily at bay. Now here's the magic. You compute capital B to the x and Bob computes capital A to the Y. Since capital B to the X equals lowercase b to the Y, in parentheses, to the X, we can use the laws of exponents to switch these. Since lowercase b to the X equals A, we have that capital B to the X is equal to capital A to the Y. This means that each of you now has a number that both of you know, but Emily doesn't. Now you can set the safe to this number and Bob can access it whenever he wants. This process is known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and I haven't gone into some of the attacks against it, but it stands as a hallmark of cryptography. It's such a crazy problem that it's amazing it even has a solution. It's, isn't it crazy? In a room full of nefarious individuals, you and a friend can share a secret, despite everyone knowing every word you say to each other. Just beautiful.